everybody said. Amen. 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 All right. Well, let's go ahead and get our our pen and pencil and our study guides and um, assign some scripture here. All right. So, who wants Ecclesiastes three eleven? Who will who will do that one? All right, Anaya, you got that one. Okay, Sedona, how about Psalm 10 4? Psalm 10 4. <laughs> how about 1 Corinthians 15 33? Who wants that? 1 Corinthians 15 33. Anybody? All right, Alicia. 1 Corinthians 15 33. Matthew 23 2. All right, Alora, Matthew 23 2. Uh, Jeremiah 15 16. Christian? All right, Jeremiah 15 16. Um, all right, Chris, you got Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Psalm 92, 14. Anybody want that? All right, Sedona. Psalm 92, 14. That's, that's a really good one. How about um, Revelation 21, 8? Anyway, all right, Brian, you got that one? Revelation 21, 8. We've got two more. Matthew 25, 32. All right, Christian, you got that one too. Matthew 25, 32. One more, Psalm 34, 15. All right, Chris, you got that one. Psalm 34, 15 as well. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a second to find that. We're going to be in Psalm 1 tonight. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 1 tonight. We're starting uh, just a new study. I just felt like we wanted to, I just wanted to do something a little... Uh, little uh, from the Psalms. It was either that or where I was going to do this or I was, was going to do uh, the spiritual life and uh, we're going to talk about some heavier stuff, some, some more doctrinal stuff. But um, th this is a good study for us, I think, at this point in time. I just felt like this is what God wanted us to do. So that's where we're in Journey from Despair to Delight. Uh, just looking at some selected Psalms and the different Psalms throughout the Scripture. Tonight, we're beginning with Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. So you got your Bible, hold up, let's do our pledge. Say, I believe, I believe that, my Bible that my Bible is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. I will love it. I will love it. I will learn it. I will learn and it. And I will live it. And I will live it. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. Amen. That's our commitment to the Word of God. Uh, here's what Psalm 1, 1 through 6 says. The psalmist says, Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the wicked. I'm oh, sorry, let me say that again. <laughs> Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree then planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked will what? Perish. Will perish. The way of the wicked will perish. That's, um, that's not a suggested tone, is it? Yeah. No, no that's, a, that's more of a promise, isn't it? I mean, when you, the way of the wicked will, not might... Well, maybe, but we'll perish. You heard the old saying, you only go around once in life, so you got to grab for all the gusto you can. You heard that? You ever, you ever heard that one? You never heard that one? You guys never heard that one? You never heard that one, Sedona? No. Hardy, you ever heard that one? You got to grab all the gusto you can? You got to be a certain age. Oh, man, you got to be a certain age to do this. That's true. You got to be a certain age. Because it was a beer commercial, but it was for Schlitz beer. It was a Schlitz beer commercial. And part of that commercial, by the way, Schlitz beer, they, they, went, out of they went out of business big time. Because they, they, well, they, they're still being produced back east, but uh, by another company, by, by Pabst or something like that. But, but Schlitz went out of business because, but frankly, because of the poor advertising campaigns that they did. And uh, I mean, um, in fact, one of their ads, one of Schlitz's ads said this, you better, you better drink Schlitz or we'll kill you. Uh, that was that was one of their ads, so it didn't it didn't go very well. Uh, needless to say, all the all the ad guys who were behind that got fired. Uh, but 
drink our beer or we'll kill you. Well, that, that went over well. Part of the mafia or something? Yeah, I don't know, but it was, it was not a very good campaign. But they did come up with this one, and it kind of saved the company for a period of time because it was, it was something that was catchy. You know, it was the, the idea of gusto. And, uh, and if you want to go around once in life, you got to go with all the gusto you can get. And, uh, and, and so the question then is, and by the way, have you, have you guys ever even heard the word gusto? <coughs> you never heard gusto? You've heard gusto, right? Have you heard gusto? Yeah. Gusto? Yeah. You got gusto, man. Right. Um, what does it mean? Well, in the dictionary, the, the dictionary defines it this way. It's vigorous enjoyment or zest. That's what gusto means. Vigorous enjoyment or zest. But where do you find it? Well, according to this ad, right, real gusto is going to be found where? When you drink what? Beer. Beer. Yeah, drink the beer and you're going to get all the gusto you can. See, that's what, that's what you know. Uh, by the way, they went out of business because they're advertising. Does that sound like a current mm -hmm. beer company today? I mean, uh, sounds like Budweiser is about, yeah, is about to go out of business because of that as well. I mean, they're, they're really in a, in a tough spot right now. But, which they should be. Amen? I mean, they yeah. should be. But, yeah. um, you know, so, but it's found in, in, in drinking a certain kind of beer. So, what we're really talking about here is the pursuit of happiness. That's what we're really talking about. And uh, in our culture uh, today, a lot of people find a certain amount of happiness in the comfortable lives that they lead. Um, no matter what that comfort may be to them, but that's where they find it. And that happiness, though, tends to be shallow because just beneath the surface of that kind of happiness is boredom and then comes disappointment. Once you become bored with something, you end up being disappointed by it. Does that make sense? When you're bored with something, you get disappointed by it. For example, after winning the Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl 30 it was, after winning that Super Bowl, a Dallas Cowboy player was sitting in the locker room uh, one hour after winning the game. Just one hour passed by, and so he was asked by a reporter in the locker room there for a quote, and his only response was, well, who do we get to play next? Now, at first, you would think he would be like, uh, you know, let me have a quote. And he goes, I'm going to Disneyland or, you know, whatever they would say at that point and stuff. But uh, he just said, who do we play next? You know what that, you know what that says? It says, even our most magnificent achievements seldom bring satisfaction for any length of time. He was already ready to play the next game before he'd even celebrated winning the Super Bowl. He was just looking to the next game and stuff. Um, straight A's on a report card getting a big promotion at work, making more money. Those things may make you happy for a little while, but that feeling doesn't last. And so where do we find real gusto? That's what, that's what the psalmist is talking about today. That's what we're talking about, finding lasting happiness. Here's what Higgles says. He says, the book of Psalms is designed to focus our thoughts on God. So what's the primary focus of the book of Psalms? To focus on who? God. God. Psalms gets us to focus on God. The Hebrew word translated psalm means praise. It signifies singing with the accompaniment of musical instruments. Psalms has 150 chapters, more than any other book in the Bible. Psalms also has several authors. King David wrote about half of the Psalms. Moses wrote Psalm 90, and Asaph, who was a worship leader at the tabernacle, he wrote about a dozen of them, and most of the others then beyond that are anonymous. The Psalms are expressions of human feelings, ranging from great joy and happiness to deep sorrow and repentance. Uh, like the 23rd Psalm, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, right? I mean, that, that particular Psalm. So, some Psalms tell us how to deal with sin and find spiritual renewal. Others teach us how to worship God. But we're going to begin our journey from despair to delight in Psalm 1 by discovering some secrets for finding lasting happiness. The first of which is this. If you want to find lasting happiness in life, that which really keeps you happy is avoid the path to unhappiness. Uh, <laughs> duh. Right? right? I mean, avoid the path to unhappiness. Don't go down that path. That's the wrong path. Don't go there. It's as if the Lord's saying, look, if, you, if you're going to find real gusto in life, don't go this way, which is the way most people go. Don't go that way. Uh, the book of Psalms, Higgles says, begins with the word blessed. The word translated blessed is a she, and it means happy. And it, but what is happiness? Many people think happiness is found in prosperity, possessions, pleasure, or prestige. But most never find happiness because they don't know what truth found in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Listen to this truth. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Wow. So God has set eternity 
in our hearts. That's what you need to write in there. God has set eternity in our hearts. That's, that's an incredible truth. And that's what I've been trying to say all along about the soul, right? Is that we aren't bodies with a soul. We are a soul that's now acquired a body. Because our soul is eternal. Our soul was created by God before we ever got a body. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, God knew us in our mother's in my in our mother's womb before he even uh, before we were ever even conceived. Psalm one thirty nine says, even before our conception, God knew us. Right? So we're 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 a soul that acquires a body. So eternity's already in our heart in that sense. Um, you know, we, we we acquire a body. I I made a statement at uh, in Tucson that I thought was kind of significant. I'm going to share it with you tonight too. That. That, uh, you know, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. Even if the rapture comes, we still die. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, you understand that, right? It's just that the death is really fast. It's so fast we can't even see it, right? I mean, it's just, it happens so quick. We go from this body into our glorified body. But it is a form of death. This body has to die because it's laden with sin. It's a sin-contaminated, sin-corroded body. And so we have to... We have to be free of this. It wasn't God's intention in the beginning for us to, to have this kind of a body, but um, because of sin in the garden now, we, we have to deal with it. And Christ has dealt with it uh, by going to the cross on uh, uh, Calvary to die for our sin. Amen? So we are a soul that has a body, and our soul is going to live on because we have eternity in our hearts. That's what the scripture says. We live forever. We live forever. So Hegel goes on to say, he says, the word translated eternity or world is olam, and it means forever. This means our hearts can't be satisfied with possessions or achievements because these things are temporary, right? Temporary. Nothing on this earth can give us lasting happiness because in every human heart there's a God-shaped vacuum that only he can fill. Letting God fill that vacuum is a key, though, to lasting happiness. So to avoid the path of unhappiness, we've got to do three things in terms of this. And uh, these next three ways are all roads to avoid. That's what I want to point out here. He's saying these are roads to avoid. First is eliminate the counsel of the wicked. Avoid that road. Uh, if you want to be happy, we cannot walk in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly. The word wicked doesn't mean atheists or bank robbers or murderers, though it can include them. In fact, how does Psalm 10.4 describe the wicked? Listen to this. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Wow. That's an amazing verse, too. In his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. That's the wicked mind. That's the wicked person. Sometimes we reserve the term wicked for, you know, witches. The wicked witch of the West, or whatever, right? I mean, you know, we, we, we you know, something wicked this way comes, or something evil this way comes. We think we, 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 we attach wickedness to something really vile, really. But by, by this definition, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him in all his thoughts, there's no room for God. Who is the wicked? Huh? Yeah. The, 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 Anybody who what does not what? See God. Yeah. They're the wicked. They're the ones who are wicked. Because they're not seeking after God's wisdom. They're not seeking after God himself. And there's no room for God because they've got it all figured out, or so they think. Right? That's who the wicked really are. Oh, damn. Well, he goes on to say, Hegel goes on to say, a wicked person is anyone who leaves God out of their lives. Listening to the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly begins then a downward spiral because their counsel can be translated into action. So in other words, if we listen to the counsel of the wicked then, and we take that counsel, guess what we're going to end up doing? Wicked, wicked things. Wicked is what they're doing. Have, we're going to be doing what they're doing. Yeah, so even though it may sound like, be like sound, sound like sound advice, you know, because we sought it from them, you know, we have to be careful because it may be something that that God interprets as being wicked as well. So therefore, to avoid the path to unhappiness, we must eliminate the counsel of the wicked. We don't need to go to the wicked for counsel. Um, and then number two, vacate the lifestyle of sinners. Vacate the lifestyle of sinners. Now the psalmist says we cannot stand in the way of sinners. And the word way means manner of life or lifestyle. 
The word translated stand is amud, and it means to abide in, to, to abide in that way. The word translated sinners literally means criminals or offenders. So participating in the lifestyle of those who break God's law makes us spiritual criminals as well. If, if we do what they're doing, then we're just as guilty as they are. And everybody said, Amen. Yeah, it's true. If we listen to the counsel of the wicked, breaking God's law will become part of our lifestyle then. We're just going to do what they're doing. Therefore, we must be very careful about the friends that we choose. Why, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. You know this verse real well, but listen to it. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Wow. Bad company will corrupt my character. That's what you write in there. Bad company is going to corrupt my character. Bad associations, that's what he says, or communications ruin our morals. Of course, we have to be careful what we watch online. So we've got to be careful what we do people we talk to what, what we at some we have to be careful what we engage in um, mm -hmm. verbally and stuff like that too you know I mean we just have to be careful that's the downward spiral of bad influence now that doesn't mean that we're not to be friends with unbelievers that's not necessarily true I mean, Jesus was called a friend of sinners but he befriended them in order to lead them to what holy living to holy lives um, so we should be friends with unbelievers but should not participate in their sinful lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay to have... And, and when I say friends, I'm, I'm not talking about besties because besties enter into each other's lives. Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. best friends tend to do that. Or really good friends tend to do that. We, we tend to just enter into each other's lives a little bit and stuff. So we're, we're talking about, you know, making acquaintances and friends, people that you can talk to, people that know you and you know them and... You know, people you work with, people you're around, things like that and stuff. You may go to, uh, you know, they're, they're having a, uh, you know, a, 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 a birthday party. You go and you celebrate that with them as long as the birthday party is a right one, mm -hmm. right? If it begins to go south, where should you go? What? Yeah, you should go south too. You should leave, right? I mean, you got to get out, right? You got to go because um, to stay, even though it's going on, is to endorse it and and, uh, and and that's not, you know, and you can you can slip out, you can leave without being rude, you can leave without being crude, you can leave without condemning, right? Uh, I mean, I, I tend to think that, I, I try to leave the condemnation to God in relationship to that, but, but you know, the fact that I'm not there, you know, is going to, there's going to be a certain amount of condemnation that comes with that anyway, Right? I mean, they're going to get the message without me being crude about it, okay? Um, and hopefully they'll respect it. If they, if they respect us at all, they'll respect our decision not to engage in those kinds of things. So, so you, sometimes you just have to get out and, uh, you know, just do that. I mean, that's why, for example, a cake maker won't make a cake for a homosexual, you know, a Christian cake maker won't make the cake for a homosexual marriage. Right? Because to do so would be to endorse it, to be participating in it, which in his mind would make him guilty as well. It wouldn't be an act of faith. It would be an act of monetary gain, but it wouldn't be an act of faith. And so to, to engage in those things becomes sin. Does that make sense? So, mm -hmm. so we, have to, we have to make these kind of decisions. So, but vacate the lifestyle of the sinners. We don't engage in that kind of thing. And number three, decontaminate our witness. In fact, the Bible puts it like this. We will not sit in the seat of mockers. Now, the word seat refers to what we might call a professor's chair in a university or uh, seminary. For example, what does Jesus say about the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23, 2? Listen to this. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Wow. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So sitting in the seat of mockers... You know, or the scornful refers to teaching or encouraging others to sin as a way of mocking God. Um, so this means we should have nothing, uh, we should not have anything in our lives that could encourage others to sin. We don't want to sit in that place. There are plenty of people sitting in that place already. They sit in the seat of enticement by virtue of what they're doing to encourage others to do the same. There's plenty of parents who are doing that to their own children. And, uh, and so we have to be careful not to do that. Uh, we don't want to entice anybody into sin. We want to help them learn to be set free from sin, not, not to uh, know how to engage in it. So to find lasting, lasting happiness, avoid the path to unhappiness. Number two, then you've got to adhere to God's word. Now, this is the path or the road to take. 
We just talked about the one not to take, the ones not to take, but now this is the path to take. And uh, to adhere means to stick to or to stay attached to. So to adhere to God's word really requires two things. One, you've got to apply God's word. The psalmist puts it like this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Some people read the Bible just to see how far they can go without crossing over the line to sin. Uh, they're looking for loopholes. I know a lot of people who do that. But the, but the person who delights in God's word has an insatiable craving to know more about the Bible because he or she has a deep desire to please God. In fact, how does Jeremiah 15, 16 describe what our reaction to God's word should be? Listen to this. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. Wow. So God's word should bring joy and delight to my heart. That's what it's saying. God's word should bring joy and delight to my heart. So Hegel says, reading or hearing God's word should be like eating your favorite food. Mm -hmm. It should be a delight. Now, let me, just, let me just share with you, and you might want to write these down just real quick. I mean, just, just jot them down some. I'm just going to give them to you kind of quick, but um, if you want to write them, that's fun. Catch some of them anyway. Let me give you the value of the word of God based on what the word of God says about itself in terms of what it can be for us. Uh, first of all, number one, it's food. The value of the Word of God, it's food, Job 27, 12, Matthew 4, 4. It's milk for the baby, 1 Peter 2, 2. In other words, it gives a baby Christian everything he needs to grow up strong and healthy, but it has to be prepared and served right. Um, right? I mean, you can't, that, that, in other words, that's the point. That's why he talks about it being milk for babies, right? So it has to be prepared and served right for baby Christians to learn to grow in it. It's meat for growing. It's meat. It's meat for growing. It's Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. Provides all that we need to sustain us and, and to stay strong in the Lord. It's bread for everyone. The Bible says it's bread for everyone. John 6, 51. Bread's the staple food of the world. No matter where you go, people need the bread of life. People always need the bread of life. It's honey for those in need. Psalm 19, 10. It's honey. Um... Nothing has the power to encourage us like God's word, amen? I mean, it's sweet to the taste. And it's light. It is light. Psalm 119, 105, it's light. It is truth. John 17, 17, it's light. It's truth. It is a mirror. It is a mirror. That's James 1, 23 through 25. It's a mirror. It's light. It's truth. It's a mirror. It is water. It's water. It's living water. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. So because it's water, it cleanses, it quenches, and it refreshes, and and that's Ephesians 5.25, John 4.13, 4, uh, and Psalm 119.1, 150. So it's, it's, it's all of those. Quenches, it cleanses, it refreshes. It's a seed. It's a seed. 1 Peter 1.23. It's a sword. Hebrews 4.12 and Ephesians 6.17. It's a sword. It is a hammer. Jeremiah 23.29. It's a hammer. It can build up. Proverbs 16.24 says, and it can tear down. Revelation 21.16 in Revelation 19, 15, it says it can tear down. It will tear down. It's a, it's a hammer. And finally, it's a fire. It is a fire. Jeremiah 29, it's a fire. I mean, those are all the... That's what the Bible, I mean, just says about itself. The Word of God says about itself. The happy, successful believer is committed to the Word of God because he knows that in its pages can be found all that the soul requires to be happy in life. Everything we need, that our soul needs, which, by the way, <laughs> when I, the, the more I think about this, so, so the soul comes first, then comes the body. What, what do you think should be fed first and foremost? Your soul. The soul. Because that's what's eternal, right? And so everything that the soul needs in order to sustain this body as well as the spirit and to do the will of God while we're here is found within the Word of God. Everything the soul needs is found right there. So Hegel goes on to say now, he says, not only does a happy person delight in God's Word, but he also, he or she also meditates day and night on it. Now meditating on God's Word is based on the same process as worrying. Worrying is taking a negative thought and thinking about it over and over again. Meditating is taking a scripture and thinking about it over and over again for the purpose of applying it to your life. So meditation and worrying are really just two sides of the same coin. You can worry or you can meditate on God's word, which will have a, a lot more benefit for you. When we apply God's word by meditating on it, the next step is automatic then. 
In other words, there's all kinds of interesting facts that we can learn about in God's Word. There's a lot of interesting things in God's Word to learn about, but the real thrill occurs when we learn to apply God's Word to our daily lives. So this next step is natural. We need to appropriate the power of God's Word. So if we allow the power of God's Word to work in our lives, we're going to be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. And just like a tree strengthened by a constant supply of water, we're going to be spiritually strengthened by the Word of God, and we will produce fruit. But what kind of fruit? Well, when we appropriate the power of the Bible into our lives, the Holy, the Holy Spirit produces what nine components of the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23? Here it is once again. Listen to this. You can fill in the blanks there. You're empty. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. All right. So there's love, joy, peace, patience, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So Hegel says the fruit of the Spirit is really a word picture of Jesus Christ. Therefore, as we appropriate the power of God's Word into our lives, we're becoming more and more like Him. The more the Word of God we get into us, the more we begin to act like Him, which means we begin to pr produce fruit. We begin to emanate in our character the very essence of Jesus Christ in that sense. So as our leaf, he says, does not wither, this means uh, that we don't burn out spiritually. Our leaf does not wither. Serving God never becomes dull, dreary, or depressing as long as we're taking in the Word of God. If we allow the power of God's Word to work in our lives, we're always going to be exciting, vivacious believers. We're always going to be that way. Finally, if we appropriate the power of God's Word in our lives, God promises that whatever we do prospers. Say that with me. Say, whatever we do prospers. Whatever, whatever we, we do, do prospers. prospers. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we're all going to get rich monetarily. That's not what he's talking about. In fact, how does Psalm 92, 14 describe the righteous? Listen to this. Here's the righteous. Listen. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Wow. So in my old age, I will bear fruit and stay fresh, green, and flourishing. Even in my old age. I, I like that. <laughs> As I'm getting older... You know, it's nice to know that that doesn't mean I can't bear fruit anymore. I can't. And, and it doesn't mean that I, I have to be kind of dried up spiritually or my soul is diminishing. Or, no, it's just not what it means at all. Uh, as long as I'm taking in the Word of God, I can stay fresh and green and I can flourish for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So, some of them, and, and to be honest, some of, the, some of the most amazing men I've ever met, met are, are older men who still have this steady diet of the Word of God coming in, and they still practice the Word of God. And they're just exciting men to be around. You guys, I don't know, you, you might remember the, the guy who came from Alaska to preach um, at our church at a revival on Park Avenue there one time. He was, uh, he was the oldest guy I've, I've ever heard preach. He was like 95 or something like that. And, uh, but, man, this guy, even... He was trying to win people to the Lord when, when we picked him up and took him to the hotel and stuff like that. I mean, it was, it was an amazing guy. And, uh, but that's because he had just the, the richness of the Word of God. Jay George, uh, about 10, 12 years older than I am, maybe a little more, but, but uh, no, he was, more, yeah, he was older than that. Yeah, 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 yeah but he, he was just a sharp guy and uh, vivacious and, and just on fire for the Lord. And so, so physical age doesn't have anything to do with spiritual age. Amen? Why? Because our soul is what? Eternal. Eternal. That's why it doesn't have anything to do with that. Physical age, I mean, the, the only thing that affects maybe uh, uh, would be dementia, loss of memory, things like that, that we just don't remember things anymore. But, but I, I honestly believe that studying and reading the Word of God and, and doing some studying on your own helps the brain anyway. I think it helps memory anyway. And so I think people who are consistently taking in a diet of the Word of God, even though they may be struggling with dementia or something like that, it certainly helps. Can't hurt, amen? Yeah. Can't hurt, but only help. So, uh, to find lasting happiness, avoid, uh, he says, this means that we're going to be spiritually fresh, exciting, productive, even in our old age. As a matter of fact, let me just say this, Stu Briscoe said this, he said, Psalm 1 describes a man who's happy even when his happenings don't happen to happen the way he wants them to happen. <laughs> and uh, what he means by that is, even in times of tragedy, even, you know, getting fired from a job, 
facing a serious illness, things like that cannot eliminate joy from a soul that's rooted in God's word. You still can't lose the joy there. Well, Hugo goes on to say, to find lasting happiness, avoid the path to unhappiness, adhere to God's word, and number three, appraise the end. Appraise the end. Take a look at what's going to happen. In verses, this is uh, Psalm 1, verses 4 through 6. This means to keep the end in view. To keep the, the end of the wicked, he says, is not like the righteous, because the wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away. Now, chaff refers to the worthless husk of wheat or other grain that just, just blows away in the wind. A life without God has no eternal value. It is worthless and as worthless as chaff blown away in the wind. Wow. Yeah. That, that word just... A life without God has no eternal value and it is what? What's that word? Worthless? worthless. Wow. It's worthless. Um, you know, instead of being like a tree, the wicked are more like husks of grain. And um, whatever gain those who rebel against God seem to get, I can tell you it's only temporary because the wind blows it away, whether it's pleasure or power or fame, it doesn't last. Whatever our current occupant in the White House, whatever he has done that he thinks he's getting away with, he's going to be held accountable for all of that in the end. He's not getting away with anything, amen? I mean, all the money, all the power, all the things that he thinks he's acquired, it's going to be gone in a moment. He's going to breathe his last breath and, and it'll be over. And, and then he's going to have to stand before God and face an accounting. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And, and sometimes we think, well, these guys are above all of that or they're immune to that. No, they're not. They're not above that at all. And this is especially true when it comes to wealth. Wealth can be so quickly lost. Amen? Amen. It can be here and gone the next day. I mean... I, the Roman philosopher Seneca once said this. He said, money has never made anyone rich. And I think that's true. Money has never made anyone rich. Um, money's helpful. <laughs> no denying that, amen? Money's helpful, but you're not rich by virtue of how much money you have. The only thing that makes us rich is how much of Jesus we have, amen? Yes. How much Christ do we really take in? In fact, therefore, he says, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. They cannot withstand the judgment of God. Revelation 21.8 lists the kinds of people who will have their place in the lake of fire. Now, what two kinds of people had the list? Listen to, listen to the whole list, but here's the first two that had it. Listen to this. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and Wow. So the first two there are cowards and unbelievers. Unfaithful cowards and unbelievers. They hid the list. <laughs> they had the first two in the list. Cowards and unbelievers. Now the cowardly or fearful are those who are afraid to take their stand for Jesus Christ. Now, pause for just a moment. They're afraid to take their stand for Jesus Christ, which means... They're not just backslidden Christians because that list, that start of that list, ends where? Where does it end, Christian? Where are they going to end up? In the lake of fire, which is hell, right? Yeah. So we're not talking about believers here, right? When we talk about the cowards or the fearful, we're talking about people who play the game of Christianity. We're talking about fakers. And when the pressure's on, they chicken out. They're cowardly. They don't have the faith because they've never been saved to stand. And so they wimp out. They're afraid to take their stand for Jesus Christ. The unbelieving refers to those who never placed their faith in Christ. You know, and they, they just say, yeah, I just have never done that, right? But they're the unbelieving still. The fearful, the cowards, are the ones who attend church. They may go to this Episcopal church. They may go to this... Lutheran Church, they may go to this Presbyterian, you know, and even though those churches embrace wokeism, even though those churches embrace homosexuality and, and uh, do homosexual marriages and everything that's anti-God and anti-Bible, you know, they'll still think that they're all right with God because they go to that church, but when, when push comes to shove, they're not going to take their stand for Jesus Christ. Why? Because they're not really what? Christians. Saved. They're not really saved. Yeah, they're not Christians. So these two groups had God's list of horrible sinners. Now, 
Hegel says, in the end, sinners will not be allowed in the assembly of the righteous. That's Psalm 1.5. On earth today, sinners live among the righteous. Now, that's what's happening on earth, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're here. We're the righteous. We're living. Uh, sinners are living among us because we were once sinners too. Mm -hmm. We just accepted Christ. However, at judgment, they're going to discover they have no place with God's people in heaven. When Jesus returns at the end of time, his angels are going to gather all nations before him. And what will he then do according to Matthew 25, 32? Listen to this. Anybody have Matthew 25, 32? Is that a good one? Well, nobody has it? Let me give it to you then. Here it is, Matthew 25, 32. It says, separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. We're always talking about, you know, that, that we feel like there's a separation coming on right now where within the church itself there's a separation. The goats are being purged out of the, the flock. And, and, uh, but that's going to happen at the end too. Uh, one day these people are going to be judged. Someone once said, in the choir of life, it's easy to fake the words, but someday each of us is going to have to sing a solo before God. <laughs> you won't be able to fake it then. Amen? Yeah. You won't be able to fake it then. Revelation 20, verse 15 says, If anyone's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So that's one of the most solemn verses in the whole Bible, I think. Revelation 20, 15. Name's not in the Lamb's book of life. It's, you're going to be separated unto hell then. So the entire, he says, Hegel says, the entire first psalm is summed up like this. In verse 6, he says, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the wicked, uh, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked will what? Once again? Perish. perish. Lasting happiness is found in believing God's promise that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Let's take that path. Amen? Mm -hmm. How does Psalm 34, 15 amplify this statement? Listen to this. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. Okay. If I am righteous, the eyes of the Lord are on me. If I'm righteous, the eyes of the Lord are on me, and he listens to my cry. Eyes of the Lord are on me, and he listens to my cry. That means we're never going to have to go through a problem alone. He's going to hear us, and He's going to see us through everything. Amen? Amen. Amen. He hears us and sees us through everything. Um, so to find last, lasting happiness, you've got to avoid the path to unhappiness, adhere to God's Word, and appraise the end. And so let me just finish by saying that the message I think here is pretty clear for today. Real gusto, <laughs> the joy of life, happiness in life, is found in godliness. If we're looking for it somewhere else, then we're making a mistake and we're not going to find it. And as Christians, let's stop allowing the wicked to be our influence. Let's make sure we're not taking counsel from the wicked. But rather, as Christians, let's make sure we have a biblical worldview so that we can get God's perspective and make our own choices based on God's word. Amen? Mm -hmm. Let's not let the world do that for us. And boy, I'll tell you, we have come into a time right now where a lot of the institutions that we thought we could trust and that we depended on to give us good advice, right? Good counsel. We just can't depend on them anymore. We, we really can't. I don't know how to say this except to just maybe say it, but it seems to me that the majority of organizations, they're, they're, they're out to make as much money as they can. And they'll say and do whatever it takes to get as much money as they can. And so we have to be very careful even where we spend our money. What we're believing about the promises that they're making. The FDA, we used to believe we could trust the FDA to make sure that the things that we were purchasing, food and drug and everything was, was on the up and up and it was tested and it was good quality and all of that. You can't trust that anymore. The FDA has been bought and paid for because everybody's trying to make as much money as they can. They'll make it any way they can because the, they're following the way of the unrighteous, not the way of the righteous. Which means integrity is by the wayside now. Um, boy, we used to trust, you know, medical doctors. 
but even now I you know you have to you have to be very careful I mean you have to listen and you have to do your own research even to try to make sure that what they're telling you is the right thing to do I mean we, we can't just we can't just put our trust in what people are counseling us to do now we have to seek God first amen, amen. we have to go to God first and find out what God wants us to do and then trust him to lead us in the right direction and depend on him in the area of finances, it's the same thing. We've got to trust God's word. Do what God tells us to do. Amen? Mm -hmm. uh, boy. And God has promised to see us and to hear us, which means he's going to take care of us. Yeah. And all God's people said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he fill you with all of his goodness and may God give you the ability to follow his path all the days of your life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.